Hello everyone, I am Krishna Priya S, a student of S4CSE of Muthur Institute of Technology and Science. Welcome to my webinar. Today, we will be taking a peek into the basics of image classification using TensorFlow. So at first, we will be looking at why is image classification necessary and its applications. We will see what are neural networks and how they are related to image classification and also how they work. Then we'll be brushing through some of the libraries we are going to use to build our model today. I'll also show you what MNIST dataset is and we'll be using the same to train our model. Last but not the least, I'll demonstrate a simple implementation of how to build a model using TensorFlow and I'll be using Google Scholab for the same. So let's get started and learn something new. Let me put forth a situation. Imagine visiting a foreign country. Let's say it's Russia and you don't know how to read Russian. How are you going to read the signboards? Of course, Google's real-time translation, which makes things really, really easy for you, comes to the safe. Have you put a thought into how Google does this? How does a machine classify image? It's the same as how a human baby learns from its surroundings and recognizes it. We have to train the machine to do so. So how do we create a model and train it? The answer is artificial neural networks. Neural networks form the base of deep learning, which in turn is a subfield of machine learning where algorithms are inspired by the structure of human brain. Real-time translation is just one among thousands of applications of neural networks. So now let's take a look at how neural networks work. Neural networks take in data as input, train themselves to recognize the patterns in these data, and is able to predict the output for any other set of similar data. Today, what we are going to do is to construct a model with neural network that differentiates the handwritten image of digits ranging from 0 to 9. This is kind of like a Hello World program for any programming language. A neural network has basically three layers of neurons. At first comes the input layer, which takes in the input data, and in the end is the output layer that gives the predictions for the output. In between these layers, we have hidden layers, and this is where the actual computations by a model take place. So let us take an example of a handwritten image of digit 3. Our image is of 28 into 28 pixels, which is 784 pixels in total. Each of these pixels are fed into the input neurons. So we'll need 784 nodes at the input layer. The nodes of one layer is connected to the next layer through channels. Each of these channels are assigned values called weights. The input values are multiplied by the corresponding weights and their sum is sent as input into the nodes in the next layer. Each neuron in the hidden layer is associated with a numerical value called bias, which is then added into the input sum. The resulting value has to be passed into a threshold function and this is called an activation function. The result of this function decides whether a particular neuron should get activated or not. Only those activated neurons transmit data to the neurons in the next layer. In this way, the data propagates through the network and reaches the output layer. This is called forward propagation. In the output layer, the neurons with the highest value fix the output. The output is basically a probability value. The one with the highest probability is the output prediction. There are huge chances that your model may go wrong in its prediction. How does the neuron identify this? During the training process along with the input, the output is also fed into the network. The prediction is compared with the actual output to realize the error. And the error magnitude indicates how wrong we are. This information is transferred backward in our network. This is backward propagation. And based on this, the weights are adjusted. The forward and the backward propagation is iteratively done till the error is reduced considerably. So that's how the training part is done. 
So how do we actually build a model and who will help us with it? Implementation of machine learning models is far less daunting and difficult than it used to be earlier. Thanks to machine learning frameworks such as Google's TensorFlow that ease the process of acquiring data, training models, solving predictions, and refining our future results. Created by Google's Brain team, TensorFlow is an open source library for numerical computations and large scale machine learning. TensorFlow bundles together a study of machine learning and deep learning models and their algorithms to make them useful. TensorFlow offers multiple levels of abstraction. We can build and train models using high level Keras API, which makes getting started with TensorFlow and machine learning very, very easy. Keras is an open source neural network library written in Python, thus easy to debug and it runs on top of TensorFlow. Some of the other libraries we are going to use are Matplotlib and NumPy. Matplotlib is a plotting library for Python and is used along with NumPy to provide an environment that is an effective open source alternative for MATLAB. We'll see more about this during our demo. Now, moving on to the data set we are going to use, which is the MNIST data set. This data set contains 60,000 training examples and 10,000 text examples of handwritten digits from 0 to 9 along with their labels. So I'm not going to bore you with the theory. Let's go into something basic implementation process. Um, so here we are in a Google Colab notebook. So let's get our hands dirty with some coding and build our own model that classifies images of handwritten digits. So first of all, what we have to do is we have to import TensorFlow. So we'll do that first. Import TensorFlow as TF. We'll also see the version of TensorFlow we're using. And version yeah, that underscore underscore version underscore underscore so this will just run it yeah we're using 2.20 that's the version we use now secondly we're going to import our data set the MS data set so we have to uh, we have it available in the Keras data sets. So we can import it from TensorFlow dot Keras dot data sets. Import yes. yes. Now we have a helper function that is the load data and it returns the training and test data so we can use the helper function to get our training and test data so we get our training image samples into x train our training labels into y train and we will get our test images into x test and our Test labels in the Y test. Yeah. So we'll call the MNIST dot load data. So let's run the code. See. So you can see the data set has been downloaded. So let's take a look at the shapes of our imported arrays. We just imported our data set. So let's better take a look at the shapes of it. So we print. Shape. That's. Not shape. We'll do the same for 
all the four. And we'll just make a change in all the variables. We are making a change in all the variables. And So yeah, I guess we're done. Okay, we're done. So we'll try running this and take a look at the shape of our imported arrays. Yeah, so here you go. The X frame shape is 60,000 comma 28 comma 28. What does this mean? Um, in our training set, we have 60,000 image samples, each of 28 in the 28 pixels. And the label, the white train shape, it's a, it's an array of 60,000 labels, each corresponding to each image in the extra shape. Similarly, the test data set, there are 10,000 image examples, each of 28 and 28 pixels, and the white test shape, 10,000 labels corresponding to each of the images. So let's take a look at one of the examples. So let's view one of our examples in the data set. So for that, we'll be using matplotlib. So we'll be importing from matplotlib. We'll be importing iplot as plt. So PyPlot is actually an important module in Matplotlib library to view or to plot 3D images. So Matplotlib line. Why are we doing this? Is because this is to set to inline so that the image is displayed below the code cell within the notebook. So that's what happening. So that the image doesn't go outside the notebook. That's why we're using our problem in line. The mode is set in line. Now we will load the image. PLT dot I am show. So we are going to read and display one of our examples. So let it be x frame of 8, say 8. And I'm setting the color map to binary. It is black and white images using. And to display it, POV don't show. So let's run this and see. Okay, we have our image. So, since it's a low resolution image, 28 into 28 pixels, still we can say it's a one, handwritten image of a one. So, let's take a look at the label of the same thing. So, to print the label, we just give Y train of 8. 8 is what we displayed just now. So let's see. Take a look at the label. Yeah, and the label here is 1. You can see it's 1. Now, we just know that we have um, labels, or uh, I mean, images of digits ranging from 0 to 1. So let's take a look at all the labels we have. How do we do that? We have to print the entire set. So we print set of white train and we will run this code so that yeah see we have labels ranging from 0 to 9 so those are the unique values in labels now what we're going to do is hot encoding one hot encoding it actually allows the representation of categorical data to be more expressive because many machine learning algorithms cannot work with categorical data directly 
These categories must be converted into some kind of numbers. After encoding, every label will be converted to a list with 10 elements. So as we have 10 labels here, we'll have 10 elements. And the element at the index to the corresponding class will be set to 1 and the rest will be set to 0. So as you can see, this is the one-hold encoding representation of 0. See, the uh, element at the 0th index is made 1 and the others are set to 0. Similarly, 9, the 1 at the index 9 is set to 1. 3, the one uh, the element at the index 3 is set to 1. So let's convert our labels into one hot and encoded labels. We have a helper function in Keras that is too categorical to do the encoding. Let's see how it's done. So what we're going to do is from tensorflow.keras.utils, we import to categorical, which is the helper function I was talking about. And um, we'll encode it. So so we're going to encode our both test and train label, training labels. So let's say it be y train underscore e and c equal to to categorical mm, and then categorical of our y train so we'll do the similar thing the test there We just make some changes, test, and we will make it y underscore test underscore enc for the encoded one. So let's run this. Yeah, we just executed it. Now we have to see if this encoding really worked. For that, let's try display. Uh, say eight y underscore train underscore b and c of 8. So it should be a one hot encoded label of the label 1. Yeah. See, the element of the index 1 is set to 1. The others are set to 0. So yeah, it worked. So we know that the input into our neural networks is going to be 784 pixels, but our image is available as 28 into 28 pixels. So let's unroll the input into 784 vectors, which is required for the input format. So to do the same, we are going to use NumPy. So let us first import NumPy as NP. Let us reshape it using NumPy reshape. This function allows to, you know, unroll it into 784 vectors. So using NumPy reshape, what we're going to use is we're going to do it to x train. And we'll call it x train vector. And you reshape x train values will be. So using np.reshape of x train. The first argument is the number of examples and the second argument will be our decide shape. So I'm giving the first argument as the number of examples that is 60,000. And my second argument would be the desired shape. Yeah. So we'll do the same for x x vector as well. So here we have to enter 6,000 to, I mean 60,000 to 10,000. Then we have to change x train into x test. 
、あの、もう注意してね、くっつくっつくね。Along with that, let's validate it by checking the shape of our reshaped vectors. So let's print. Shape of strain vector as strain underscore vector of shape, and we do the same for x test as well. Make changes in the variables we used. It's test and x test. So let's try running with that for errors. Yeah, we've got the shape. So you can see that our the shape of our extreme was sixty thousand comma twenty eight into twenty eight. So now we've reshaped the 28 and the 28 pixels and unrolled it into 784 vectors. Same with x test. Now let's take a look at the pixel values. Let's, let's see what are the pixel values in the vector. So let's take a look at the pixel value of print. We're using set function so that we get the unique values. Extreme vector of eight. We always use eight, so let's go for eight. Let's see what are the unique values. You can see the unique values ranging from zero to up to two fifty-five. So these are normal pixel values, right? These pixel values are okay to display the image. But for a neural networks to learn different weights and biases for different layers, the computations will be effective and fast if we normalize these values. So let us take a look at how this is done. Let us first calculate the mean and standard deviation of the training set with respective functions. So we will call it x mean, and we have. A function in numpy that's mean, and we calculate the mean for x train vector. And now we'll calculate the standard deviation with the help function that is np dot d x train vector. Okay. Also, I'm defining a constant with a very small value here, epsilon. I'll tell you why I'm using this. So let's normalize it. Let's call the x train normalized as x train underscore normalized. So what we're going to do is we're going to subtract mean from the x test vector, x train vector. We're going to subtract it, subtract mean from it, and then we'll divide it by standard deviation. And add epsilon to it. Normally, you would just divide by the standard deviation, but if the value of the standard deviation becomes very small, there might be instability in the computation process. So that is why I'm adding a small value so that this problem gets solved. Now I'm going to use the same for x test.
you'll be wondering why do we apply the same mean and standard deviation value for the excess as, as well as the extreme. This is simply to avoid the unnecessary bias that may be caused by calculating it differently. So now let's run the output and let's see what happens. Actually, let's normalize it. So yeah, that one, that part is compiled. Now let's display and see if the normalization actually worked. For that, we we'll print set so that we get unique values of extreme normalized. And we'll print of eight, like we did earlier. Compiling, and yeah, now you can see all these values are normalized, and they are small values. So this makes the computations far more easier. Now we are getting into our main part. We are going to create our model. We will simply be using sequential class to find and create us and add some layers into it. In our model, we will have uh, 128 nodes each for the given layers. 784 nodes are the input layer as we discussed earlier and 10 nodes are the output. These 10 nodes are the final classes that are ranging from 0 to 9. All these layers are going to be dense layers. Um, dense layers means all the nodes of a layer will be connected to all the nodes of a preceding layer. That's what dense layers is. So let's start by importing sequential class and the layer that we're going to use that's dense. So from TensorFlow dot Errors dot models. We're going to import sequential from TensorFlow dot errors with layers. We'll import dense. So let's add our layers into the model. So how we do this is we can pass a list of layers into the sequential class that is model equal to sequential and inside we're going to give the layers that is our first layer being dense. Uh, as we said earlier, we'll be using 128 nodes in our hidden layers each. We'll have to specify an activation function. So we're using ReLU activation function here. So ReLU activation function is mathematically y equal to max zero fix, as you can see. Relu activation function, the rectified linear unit function is used in the hidden layers because apart from other functions like tan and sigmoid, etc., Relu does not activate all the neurons at the same time. If you remember, I explained earlier what activation functions are for. It selects the neurons which should pass on input to the next layer. So in Relu, a neuron is deactivated only if the output of the linear transformation is less than zero. So that is why we're using ReLU here. What we want to specify next here is the input shape. Our input shape is 784. So next we will be defining the next tenth layer. Again, our hidden layer will have 128. And the activation, again the value. So we don't have to specify the input shape. You would be thinking about where is the input layer? We've started directly from the hidden layers. You don't have to define the input layer separately. You just need 
to make sure that uh, it corresponds to the input shape. And we are not using the input shape in the next layer because you don't have to specify it again and again. You just have to specify it once in the beginning. So we are done with our hidden layers. Now moving on to the output layer, we have 10 layers in the output corresponding to each of the output classes. And the activation function we are going to use here is not ReLU. It's going to be softmax. While dealing with classification, we usually use softmax activation function at the output. If it's regression, we use the new activation function at the output layer. The purpose of the activation function is just to help the neural network find non-linear patterns in the data because if we just output from each layer and keep on cascading it, then the output will still be a linear function. So activation in a short gives the model a lot more flexibility. So let us run this part of the code. Yeah, we compile that part. Now let's compile our model. In addition to setting up our model architecture, we need to define which algorithm we would use in order to optimize the weights and biases as per the given data. So for that, we have to compile our model. What are optimizers? Optimizers are really algorithms or methods used to change the attributes of the neural network data, such as the weights, the learning rate, in order to reduce the losses. So optimizers help to get better results faster. So for that, there are a lot of different options here, but we are going to use one of the commonly used stochastic gradient descent or STD. So let's do it, model.compile. And we want to specify our optimizer as stochastic gradient descent or STD. We have to define a loss function and you can think of this function as the difference between the predicted outputs and the actual outputs. And this is the loss that needs to be minimized by using the optimization algorithm. So loss function you can use categorical words and property. No matter different types of optimizer algorithms, loss functions and all, you'll, you'll always have to read about, to know what each of these functions do or what each of these optimizers do. We'll also define a metrics that we'll take a look at as the model trains. So our metrics we'll be using accuracy, Yeah. Now we'll be calling summary method on our model so that the architecture is displayed. We have to take a look at the architecture, right? Running the code. So yeah. Here we have the architecture display. So the architecture shows nothing but the output shape of, we have 128 layers and the hidden layer one, hidden layer two has 128 layers, that's a dense network. And in the output layer, we have 10, 10 nodes. These are the trainable parameters. So in total, we have 118,000 trainable parameters. So how is this calculated? We know that there are 784 nodes in the input layer. So, and the 128 nodes in our first hidden layer. So how do we get the number of trainable parameters? It's actually 784 in the 128 plus 128 nodes in the hidden layer. So that gives us 100,480. Similarly, all these trainable parameters are calculated with uh, the product of the number of nodes in the previous layer and the present layer plus the number of nodes in the present hidden layer. So that's all about uh, the architecture of our model. Now it's time to train our model. 
we've just created the architecture of our model. Now it's time to tell our model what type of images it has to classify and how it has to classify. So we'll feed in our training examples, the images and the labels. So we'll use model.fit method to train our model. So it goes something like this, model.fit. Uh, so we have to use the normalized vectors. And when we use the labels, we have to use the encoded ones. We are specifying an epox three. So here we are reserving the uh, test set for testing part and we are training our model using our training set, uh, which has been normalized and which has been reshaped. So also we are going to train our model. I told you we are using an epox of three. So you can think of an epoch to be an iteration of all the examples going through the model. So when epoch is equal to three, we will go through the training examples three times. The model will train itself by iterating through the examples three times. So that is what all epochs are about. So we will do the training process here. You can see the model is getting trained. And you can see each epoch. So we're done. The accuracy we have here is 95.9. It can differ for you when you do it. So just don't worry. It'll be closer to 95.9. It can differ for each data set and each model. Now we're going to evaluate our model. We'll use model.evaluate method to evaluate our model and pass the test set. Let's look at how it's done. We're going to get loss and the accuracy. So we use model dot evaluate. And we're going to evaluate using the test set. The normalized test set and the encoded labels of the test set. And we are going to print the accuracy. Let's see the accuracy. Accuracy is what we want to see. So we will print the accuracy mm, since it's in decimals. We will do accuracy multiplied by 100. Now let's run this and look at the accuracy of our model. Yeah, we got an accuracy of 96.2. So that is a very good accuracy. So, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at the shape of the predictions on the test set. So for that, we have to go and define variable predictions. And we're going to do use model.predict method for the same. And we're using express normalized. This is just so that we can Take a look at the shape of the predictions. So we're just printing the shape as let's start shape. Mm, it's a small case shape. And we're gonna run it. Yeah, and the shape is 10,000, comma 10. So we got the shape of our predictions. We have 10,000 examples. And we have 10 different predictions for each. That is probably the values of each of the prediction. Now let us visualize our predictions. We can't go through all the 10,000 predictions, but we can really go through a few. So first we're going to create a figure. We are here a figure. And let the size of the figure be mm, come on. Mm. Okay. 
Mm, we are going to define an index variable starting from zero. We are going to create a loop so that we can take a look at first 25 predictions. We are going to use a 5 by 5 grid. We really don't want to see the grid or xx or yx. So we'll do that. Yeah. Now as I told earlier, the output predictions are actually probability values. So to get the correct prediction, so to know what is the final prediction, we have to find out the value which has the maximum probability. So that will be the real prediction of our model. So we have to do a bit of pre-processing. For that, we're creating a variable prediction. And we're going to use the argmax, fun argmax function, which is actually a function that selects between a lot of values. It selects the maximum value, the maximum, the biggest prediction is selected. To. So that will be the output of our model. So we are selecting it from the variable predictions we created before index plus i. Now we also need to have our ground truth in hand. So that is from the y test. It is the real output or the labels we already had for the test for the test group. So we're using that as the ground truth. We will set color as green, say green. And if the prediction is not equal to the ground truth. What we're going to do is we'll change the color into say red. This using the different color makes it easy to notice any error in our prediction. So now we got we got to show the label. So we're going to format the label how it should look. So this is how we're going to make it. We're going to show the index. We're going to show the prediction, and we're going to show the ground truth. And we're going to format it as x plus i will show the prediction and we have the ground truth here. Also, we'll set the color as what we define C well. Now we have to read the image. To read the image, we have plt.in show. We can't use normalized vectors here. So, because while displaying the image, we need pixel values between 0 to 255. So, we are going to use the text test variable. And we have index plus i as the index. And we'll be giving a color map of binary and last we're gonna do plt of show so that all the shows on the screen wait a minute the okay yeah so let's just run the code and see it works yeah it did so yeah, here you go. Here are your first 25 predictions. You can see the predictions I see here. It's see here. It's first prediction. Prediction is zero. Ground truth. Prediction is seven, and ground truth is also seven. Here the prediction is two. Ground truth is also two. Where we've gone wrong is at the eighth index. 
the prediction is 6 and the ground truth is 5. So it's actually evident from the image that the model can really go get confused in this image because it seems like a uh, 6 2 but it's actually a 5. So let us take a look at the graph of the result and see what happened there. So for that we'll use plt.plot prediction of which was the index it went wrong at 8. So we'll take a look at that and plt.show. So let's see the graph. Yeah, we got the graph and the graph shows something like this. If you look carefully, you can see that at position 5, the graph has a bit more probability than 0 to 4 or 7 to 9. But it goes high like a peak at 6. That is why our model gave us a wrong prediction. So you can get rid of this wrong prediction by training our model by feeding in the test data so that it never goes wrong in the same prediction again. So as you all did guess, we are just scratching the surface here. TensorFlow is an incredibly powerful tool for machine learning and I hope this webinar has set you off on a journey to explore its full potential. So that's all what we'll be doing for today. So let us keep on exploring more and more towards learning something new. So thank you so much everyone for participating. Stay home, stay safe, take care.